Parker McCollum is on the TV set. Yes, sir. How you doing? I was just looking this up because I remember I met you at, at Nutty Brown's, and uh, you probably don't. I'll show you this picture because I had really long hair back then. See that? Holy cow. Yeah, see? I was really short, and I and I had the body of a 15-year-old girl. And hey, that's, a, that's a pretty good photo. You may have sent that to me. Yeah, it was, it, was a ma it, was a, it was a magic time for me, you know? That was back before you really hit big, so I got a lot closer to you than they let me get there now, so... <laughs> Yes, sir. All the difference a hit makes, huh, brother? Yeah, well, we'd be there uh, in person if it wasn't for all this crazy stuff going on. So, Yeah, we just talked for like 15 minutes and didn't realize we weren't on. And you were saying that you've done some socially distanced shows. And, right. and I'd imagine it's probably, I mean, because I know that you pride yourself on your live show. I mean, you think a lot about how to tempo and, and how to get them going. It, it, they seem more reserved because they're wearing masks and or do they still just enjoy it immensely? Well, I mean, I, it seems to me as though they enjoy it. And then obviously you can tell, <clears throat> excuse me, you can tell afterwards on social media whether they enjoyed it or not. Um, but it's it's different because the crowd's so much further away. So it really, since we hadn't played in, in so long when we did it, I really, uh, it, it kind of allowed me a couple times in the show to just kind of, you know, uh, kind of uh, hone in on where I was and what I was doing and enjoy being on stage again and uh, really just kind of close your eyes and, and feel, uh, you know, nothing but music for, for a brief moment. So it, uh, uh, there was kind of a part of it that I really enjoyed. And then there's, you know, the whole time you're like, man, you can't touch their hands. You can't, there's no meet and greet before the show. You don't feel, uh, you know, kind of the sense of your fans are there more just people. It seems like people just watching you, but I mean, it was, um, for the circumstances, I think it was great. And, and we were speaking earlier. I wanted to mention you, you have been through it. You already had COVID and got through it. And now you're coursing with the antibodies and, and, and you said it wasn't, you didn't have, it wasn't super serious for you, but, but tell them how you knew, because this is just the weirdest side effect for me. I just can't. Yeah. It's, it's, it was, uh, I tried to explain it. Uh, it's like my family and stuff. I was like, I, I, it's so bizarre. Quite probably the most bizarre thing I've ever experienced. Uh, but I just woke up and went to eat breakfast and and thought there was something wrong with breakfast and everybody else was enjoying it fine. And and uh, and I I couldn't taste or I started tasting and smelling everything. I couldn't taste breakfast. I couldn't smell the cologne in the bathroom. I couldn't. Uh, I got it. It was like eight o'clock in the morning. I got a Dr. Pepper out of the fridge. Couldn't taste the Dr. Pepper. Um, and, and that's 23 flavors you're missing right there. So there was, right. no, there was no doubt in my mind that I was like, I was like, I got to go get tested right now. So wow. I kind of, kind of like the not being able to smell in the bathroom thing that might come in handy. You know, once the Dr. Pepper and bacon starts making its way through. Yeah. There was, there was plenty of, plenty of uh, room for jokes. I think from my buddies that, uh, that they were trying to think of some advantages to not being able to taste or smell. Um, but it, uh, I mean, it, I know there's a lot of people that, that had a rough time with it and, and, and COVID was not good to them. Um, and so I was just glad to, to be one that, you know, I mean, I never felt bad or anything like that. I just couldn't taste or smell anything for like a week and a half. So it came back just like one day you're like, Hmm, I can taste it. It was gradual, you know. I was out. I had my bus take me to the ranch. Uh, once I realized I had it, I quarantined out there for ten days. And every morning at sunrise, I'd get up and make coffee and and get on my side by side and go right around the ranch at sunrise. Uh, and it's really bizarre to drink coffee, which is something that has such a strong aroma and such a strong taste, and wakes up so many senses and triggers so many things. And there's just nothing. It's really odd. Uh, and then every night I would grill a ribeye on an open charcoal grill outside of the bus and, and I couldn't taste or smell a single bit of smoke or steak or seasoning. It was, it really was bizarre. And then slowly, you know, I can, I all of a sudden about a week and a half later, I noticed I was still there doing the same thing every day. Uh, and I just kind of noticed I could taste the coffee a little bit and the next day I could taste a little more and then I could smell a little bit. And, um, I think it's all the way back now. What a waste of a ribeye. Shame on you. You should have given it to somebody. Should have given it to one of your roadies who can taste, and you could have gotten down some damn dirt. My taste was was so absent. I'm pretty sure I could have just, 
eating it with no seasoning, probably very undercooked or overcooked. You wouldn't, you would not know. At all. You probably could have gone out to the damn ranch and sucked on a cow's butt, and not even knowing it. Yeah, it, by the way. I don't think I don't know if there's anything in the world that would make me want to do that, but um, but yeah, even with the uh, with no taste and smell, I probably would do no cow butt sucking. Well, is that is that the reason that your your new song is called Nasal Swabbing? Is that based upon your COVID experience? It sure is. Yes, it's actually the album title now is Nasal Swab. Oh, it is, which is a really unpleasant experience to to have to kind of go through that and uh, and have them stick that thing up behind your eyeball. So nasal swabbing that's gonna, that's going to be a big hit. Although I wanted to ask you, your first was it your first down? Was it that was that the Limestone Kid? Yes, sir. You have to explain that to me because I'm I'm from Kansas, so I know about limestone. I just can't figure out why that would be a moniker. So you're gonna have to explain that because uh, it's just so random to me. So it's pretty simple. My my granddad was just a great cowboy, um, one probably one of the best to ever live, and um, big cattle rancher. Uh, and I worked for him a lot growing up in the summertime. Me and all my cousins did just kind of ranch handing for him. And uh, uh, one of his ranches in, is in Limestone County, which is in Central Texas. Um, and it just and I was really into the record, The Houston Kid by Rodney Crowell at the time, um, and still really am to this day. Uh, was really into Billy the Kid. Um, the movie Young Guns kind of sparked that at an early age, and just really the concept and idea of of doing what you do uh, or what you try to do in life at a really young age and being successful at a young age um, and kind of being a kid. Uh, you know, and, and doing something well. So when I thought of the limestone kid, it was, I just thought it sounded cool. And, um, and nobody ever called me that or anything. It was really, it was originally going to be the limestone kids about me and all my cousins. Um, but I simply just thought li the limestone kids sounded better and there was nothing else I could find online that, that had anything that said that. So it seemed like a good idea. Yeah. If you grew up in some kind of weird orphanage, you know, and they called you the limestone kids, that would be a better story than just, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Thank goodness. I, mean, I know the city next door is is thick urine, Texas. You wouldn't want to have been the thick urine kid. Thank God his ranch was next door. Yeah, you would. You don't want to be the thick urine kid. No, no. It's funny because I wrote, I, I read a lot about you today, and and you you describe yourself as 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 uh, obsessive when it comes to your music. You said, let me get the quote here. When a particular melody, lyric, or emotion tugs at him, he might stay in his room for days working on it. Is that, uh, is that just your nature, man, that you just got to, it gets in your head and you just got to finish it, see it through? Uh, well, I mean, it's kind of like anything else in my life. It's really a bunch of phases. Um, or there's a few phases and I kind of go through all of them throughout the year, I think. Um, and there's a time, you know, like this time every year, kind of when it goes from summer to fall, I get into this almost kind of get in your feelings and in your mind and um, things kind of start tighten, tightening up mentally and, and um, songwriting that seems to kind of see an increase in where, how much my day is spent doing anything. Uh, songwriting just increases. Uh, and so it doesn't, I mean, it can be any time of day in any state of mind. Uh, if, if I have a melody or something that, I just am, am immediately moved by and think is worth chasing. And I'll, I usually chase it down until I get it done. It was crazy because the article you're quoted is saying, I've gone two weeks without bathing using an old five gallon mop bucket as a bathroom until that song is done. I think that's beautiful. That is, that's devotion. You don't see that kind of devotion anymore. Quite the way with words. I'm just telling you, you know, who else used to do that Clint black. He'd go a month. And he'd smell terrible. I don't know how Lisa Hartman put up with it, but so you've got that going for you, brother. And that kind of determination is going to take you, probably not to the top, but to the middle. Okay. Well, the middle, the middle, I guess, would work for a little while. <laughs> so uh, let me think here. So second album, probably wrong. Is that right? Yes, sir. And that one, I got to tell you, you, you say it was. Uh, you had a paper filled with soul crushing lyrics mined from your self imposed sadness. That isn't how you promoted it, was it? Because I got to tell you, it don't sound feel good music to me. No, yeah, there's no feel good songs are not my forte. Um, which I've I've recently tried to kind of challenge myself with trying to write some. I'm not. It's not my thing. I try to stay in my own lane. Um, but that record was just talk about a phase i was i was in a big phase there um 
and kind of really did some stupid things to write that record. Um, just as far as trying to get in the right mindset and, and force creative juices to flow. I did it all in, I think four or five weeks. I wrote that record. Um, and, uh, but I mean, it, it, it worked a little bit, so it can't be all that bad. You're a method guy, man. You threw yourself into deeper sadness than you needed just to get the soul crushing lyrics as you describe them. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, that those feelings were kind of bound to arrive anyways. I don't think I was far off from it where I was in my life, but um, I think I just saw it coming and I was like, well, you know, if we're about to go through this and go through it pretty hard, uh, we might as well try to, you know, make some money off of it. So, well, you said in that article that it was because uh, your longtime girlfriend left you for the assistant manager at the Dairy Queen in Austin. And that's, I mean, you're an upcoming country star. This guy's making self-serve and she tosses you aside. I, I That's soul crushing right there. Yeah. Well, I mean, had that been the real story, I don't even think I'd be mad because I love Dairy Queen. So okay. maybe there could have been some sort of uh, three-way marriage that could have gotten me a discount coupon at Dairy Queen and I wouldn't complain about that maybe you can modify and make that the story because i think i came up with a better story than the real one write the bio let's do it yeah and then you might get some action out of dairy queen you know you put like a, a certain beer or a certain whiskey in one of your songs they send you a case of it imagine if your song was all about dairy queen you know yeah i mean i've gotten action in a dairy queen but i've never gotten any action out of dairy queen so um you know there's always room for improvement <laughs> you are a texas boy let me tell you that much a little little brazier and a little brazier in the same night, man. Oh. Yeah, I mean, just go easy on them always, you know. Stay smooth. I will tell you something, uh, and, and this is just having listened to your music for because you you're not brand new to the scene. What did you start at about two thousand? Like you've been at seven or eight years, haven't you? At least uh, I put out my first EP in two thousand and thirteen. Yeah, seven years. Yeah, seven years, and that's crazy. So even though Pretty Heart's just hitting now, I mean, you've you've put in some time. I mean, you were pretty – I mean, you're a pretty big thing down in your area, but now finally the rest of us get to enjoy. But you said that your forte is not upbeat songs, but you know what What I think is a fantastic song is Let It Fly. Oh, Learn to Fly. Learn to Fly. It, yeah. Honestly, if you listen to it and you close your eyes, it's got the same wonderful cadence and pacing as Wagon Wheel, and it's just – that's a great feel good song, even if you didn't mean it to. It's just that's well, you know, my, my brother, who's six years older than I am, wrote that when he was a freshman in college. On each of my first two records, I covered one of my brother's songs and my older cousin's songs, just to kind of as a thank you for, um, you know, showing me what songwriting was and, and how to try to, you know, be good at it. Um, and uh, and that was a song he, my brother had written his freshman year of college. Um, so I was in seventh grade, sixth grade, his freshman year of college. And I cut it on my rec on my EP when I was 21, 22. So um, I, I knew that song was good for a long time. Yeah, honestly, if you listen to it back to back with Wagon Wheel, it's just got that same going down the road funk. So yeah. I just don't think that song, we hit that song on, uh, I, we didn't hit that nail on the head in the studio then. Um, a lot of that record I think was cool, but there, I remember leaving and, and, and not being totally pleased with, I just kind of, I think I rushed that album. I don't think we, we really put the time in that we should have. And that's hard. And, and a lot of those songs did really well for us, but or a few of them did. So um, hindsight's twenty twenty. but I, maybe that song deserves a little more love one day. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you just, I'm sure it devokes the memories of seventh grade with your bad complexion and being very unpopular in school. So it probably dredges up some more soul crushing lyrics. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I need all I can get right now. So, so, uh, Pretty Heart, is that going to come out? Is that with an album, or for now it's just going to fly on its own and, and get you up those charts? Um, well, it's on its own right now, but it will be on the EP that comes out next month, six-song EP coming out mid-October. Um, and I'm super excited about that, and the full album hopefully will be out at the beginning of the year. I think the album's done. I think the label's kind of waiting for me to come through with something that is an upbeat song. Um which is just not my thing. I just don't. Um, it's hard for me to be honest and feel like I can go out there and sing it every night if it's just if it's not very real and comes from where everything else comes from. So or that I write comes from. So 
Um, I don't know. There'll be EP out next month, and we'll just see where it goes from there. Yeah, say, I mean, that may be your forte, brother, but the one thing we probably don't need during the COVID racial tension time is soul-crushing lyrics. <laughs> no, it's uh, it, it, you know, it's just all about how you walk that line. There's a there is a, a way to be charismatic and elegant about it, I think. Um, and people, and I think people need those songs, man. People are always going to need sad songs. So, um, and, and I, I'm not a sad person, but I love sad songs. So, uh, hopefully, there's enough like that, like me out there. <laughs> well, and that's the thing, because you're young and you're a good looking kid and you're talented. So, you know, for the rest of us, the, life is a sad song. For you, it's just like you're just messing around with our lives, buddy. Nasal yeah. swabbing. You're just nasal swabbing. Yeah, that's that's one way to put it. <laughs> so, um, I know that that you uh, you got a lot of heroes that you've followed, but I thought what was really great is that I don't know who it was, but somebody compared you to one of my favorite musicians in the world, and John Mayer. I mean, that's that's a pretty good compliment. He's he's a pretty talented kid. Yeah, it, he's. He's the greatest contemporary artist of the last 20 years, maybe longer. Um, what him and him and George Strait are my top two all time. Um, as far as who I try to, you know, they say good players steal or good players imitate great players steal, um, which is totally true. And I very much have been influenced by them two more than anybody else, hands down. I think, um, uh, but I don't think you could can. I don't, I, he's on a level that I aspire to be on one day. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I hope you can hear some, some of his influence in some of my songwriting, but um, that's probably, that'd probably be it. I'm flattered by the comparison though. Well, was it musically or the fact that you also dated Katy Perry, Jennifer Aniston, Taylor Swift, Jessica Simpson, Minka Kelly and Jennifer Love Hewitt. That's also a comparison, right? The both of you went down the same path. Yeah, he's got an all-star lineup. Uh, mine, mine doesn't look as good as his. Um, but he, uh, you know, there was a long time where I wanted, you know, he's 43 almost. He was born in 77. So he's 43 this year, I think, next month. Um, and uh, and he's not married, has no ex-wives, and has no kids. Um, and for a long time, that is how I said I was going to, he's still right, putting out hit records and, and his songwriting and he's just gotten so much better, which you didn't even think was possible as, as an artist. Uh, and for a long time, I was like, that's how I'm going to be. I was like, I'm always just going to be so committed to this, uh, and, and nothing else will take its place in my life. Um, but then I met Hallie Ray and I realized that, um, She's like the only one in the world like her. Like she will always allow my focus to be what I do in trying to write these records for the rest of my life. Um, and she's really cool with that. So not a lot of women are cool with you wanting to play guitar all day. So I was very lucky there. Let alone with soul crushing lyrics. Right. It could be the title of the next album. I'll tell you what I did enjoy a lot is uh, um, you and uh, Danielle Bradbury covering uh, Shallow. That was pretty neat. Man, that was that was a great experience. I was like, right. I don't even think I'd signed my record deal yet. Uh, that was right before that. Um, and she, I had flown to Nashville one night from Austin. I was on some doing some work there, and and she texted me and said, "Do you want to sing Shallow with me tomorrow at Dan Huff's house?" Um, and I was like, "Yeah, I just want to go to Dan Huff's house." Who's um, Dan Huff? Bring me up to speed. Who's Dan Huff? Should I know that name? Man, he played guitar for like Michael Jackson um, back in the day. I want to say like White Snake. <laughs> you, you're not old enough to even know White Snake, brother. Okay. Well, I mean, my my parents were were pretty rowdy. Um, but yeah, he just, and, and he's produced a lot of big time hit records out of Nashville in the recent years, and the guy's just a mega talent. Um, and you go there and you perform it, and he's like, "Let's let's record this. Let's make a video." No, they were already doing it. I think oh. she was already all set up. Um, I just had to go in and sing my part. Um, uh, and I went the day before to listen to the band track it. And then um, she's like, I say all the time, you know, she can, dude, she can sing note for note with Carrie Underwood, Danielle Canton. She's one of the most phenomenal singers I've ever heard personally with my own ears. Um, and I just wish that. I wish her all the success and, and good fortune in the business that she can possibly have in years to come. Uh, and so it really was, 
I thought it was badass to get to to do that with her, man. It was really a treat. What I thought was cool is that the and if you've never seen it out there, you should watch it. Is that you sing the Lady Gaga lyrics, and in the video, you're wearing this lovely evening gown, and you got the big wig on, and it's just yep. it's a it's a side of you I never <sighs> thought we'd see. And in all fairness, can't be unseen now. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just old habits is really what it comes down to. So anytime I'm allowed to to do that and I don't have to hide it in my own house, you know, and I can let my real self come out um, and let people see how I dress when I'm not on stage, then I'm all for it. Yeah, I don't see you walking down the streets of Conroe, Texas in a little halter top being you. No, I mean, well, the only reason you don't see that is because you've never been to Conroe, Texas when I've been there. But if you came there, you would see that. I'm not, I, there's no shame in my game. Did you know that Conroe, Texas, in the 1930s, because of their uh, lumber and oil business, had the most millionaires in the United States of America? I learned that today. I've actually read their Wikipedia page several times. I'm a very, very big Wikipedia guy. That was going to be my insight. I thought you would go, that's fantastic. I didn't even know that. Thank you for teaching me that. But now and I know you're a Wikipedia guy, so checkmate for you, McCulloch. Yeah, I uh, I definitely I read a lot. Um, I'm very big on re just random stuff too. Nothing really that will probably serve me any good in life. Just interesting stuff. I'm curious about. 